Whether you're fly fishing in a stream, getting those ankles wet, or deep in the ocean casting nets, fish nerds. Fish nerds. Fish nerds. It's a podcast. Hello and welcome to the Fish Nerds, the show about fish, fishing, and eating fish. I'm Clay Groves, Chief Executive Fish Nerd, Licensed Fishing Guide, and your best friend. And we're excited because the Crappie Hippie is with us again today. Hey, Crappie Hippie. How are you doing this morning, my friend Clay Groves? John, it's been a crazy winter, but I'm doing great. I'm so excited to be making this podcast with you today. How are you? I am stressed out as always, but doing just fine. That's kind of my normal state. Oh, good. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I um, yeah, I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right mainly because the Arctic blast has retreated, and now we are in classic Kansas January thaw mess where there's mud and melting snow everywhere, and my dog gets nice and dirty, and good. you know. But that's better than having my, you know, I've got frostbite on one finger because there was a hole in my glove, uh-huh. you know, this kind of thing. And uh, it, 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 and I smashed one right next to it with a piece of wood as I was loading the furnace, you know. So I'm glad to not have to be out there in that wood pile that much. Uh, <laughs> really, really glad to be. Let me uh, ask you something. A less John. of that. So yes, winter in Kansas. What's the normal? It's just about forty degrees, thirty-five degrees. A little bit wet, cold, uncomfortable, muddy. Yes. I mean, that's what they call average, but a Kansas weather graph is going to have big, big, wide curves on it, you know, high, mm-hmm. you know, oh, it can get up to 70. Oh, it can get down to minus 20. It can, you know, and so it's the average across these extreme swings that can happen. Now, like we're supposed to get average weather this week, 40s, muddy, da 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 da. Next week, 50s and possibly 60s, so and sunny. So hopefully that'll kind of dry things up. But that's, that's wild. Above average, yeah. So That's it's, wild. It's, now, when with that yeah. Arctic blast, did your ponds yeah. and lakes freeze? Yes, they did. Did you venture out? I wanted to, but I uh, my wood situation is such that I uh, had to uh, look after that. I understand. And I really wanted to venture out, but it's like I, you know, I really like to go with somebody, mm-hmm. and I could have got, I could have got, you know, Jeff or the professor or somebody to come out here, but uh, I don't know. I just, I just. You know, I got that big order to Wisconsin out, and then I, I like I told you, I had a log jam of stuff that that kind of broke open, and I had to get on that. And okay. Of course, our wonderful Glasswater customers, a lot of which listen to this podcast, are hitting me up for stuff because that, I've got a lot of guys that are in wish, you know, wishing there wasn't so much ice. They're in the not enough to walk on, too much to fish through, you know. To, yes, to, I follow. Uh, run a run a boat in, and so they want to tie bugs and do some stuff with their right. time. Oh, so. speaking of which, we should probably give your website out if you want some great lures from the crappie hippie glasswater angling. What's the website, John? Glasswaterangling.com. Lead free all the way, baby. All right, lead free all the way. Let's hey, get into this. Well, I want to get into fishing the news here real quick, but I got one last thing. I'm working on the, one of these things. I'm working on is the consolation prizes and just a little. Clay and I have stuff laying around. We're just going to stick into envelopes and send people. Hmm. And I've, I've all the nine people that that uh, sent in pieces for Napod Pomo National Podcast Posting Month. The only one is you, Kevin. I don't have your address. I've got Piper. I've got Rosie. I've got Laughing Apple. I've got all these folks. I can figure out Steve Angers, Steve Angers, excuse <laughs> me. And you know, I'll just send it to his fly shop. But uh, uh, yes, Kevin, we loved your real arrogance piece and we want to hear from you and I will be happy. I've got some, I've got some, uh, Charlie Brewer tales here, kind of some seconds here. I got some jig heads. I got, you know, I got, I'm just like clay. I got some stickers. I got some stuff laying around. Happy to send you a I fish lead free sticker or something Perfect. because we sure appreciate you to come in on it. But as for the rest, Don, I know you won the grand prize. I just ordered your shirt. I'm getting around to it. Um, and I will have this stuff out to you this week or next. Okay, enough said. Let's go. All right, let's so go. The show tonight is pretty basic. We're going to do fish in the news, and then we've got a piece from Doc Martin as well. Yeah, it's it's really a kind of a science heavy show. We've got a lot of great fish in the news for it, and then Doc has a wonderful couple of dudes that do water uh, quality studies and water quality enforcement for the Kansas Department of Health and Environment, and they're going to talk about fish kills. But awesome. first, let's do some news, Clay. I love fish in the news. News, news, fish in the news. Everybody loves their fish in the news. Take the lead, John. Okay, well, the first one I have is 
a good news piece uh, is something I just had to grab onto when I saw it because we don't get enough good news these days. And uh, you know, if you're on the fish nerd side of this anyway, I suppose if you're a uh, corporation loving industrialist extractive industry person, you may not dig this, but too bad. But the, <laughs> the Klamath River Dam removal project is underway. It's going to be the largest project so far in U.S. history removing dams to restore the uh, salmon run on the Klamath River, which is along the California-Oregon border. And Klamath River, K-L-A-M-A-T-H, um, they're starting on the smallest of the four dams, and they're going to get the other three this year, by the end of this year. And uh, the project is, is going really, really well. And uh, what we're talking about is, you know, salmon that ran up this river and were important to the uh, – First Nation peoples that live along, along this river. Um, in 2002, a combination of low water levels and warm temperatures caused a bacterial outbreak that killed 34,000 fish. So here we are on our fish kill theme. And uh, this is what propelled the First Nation people there to get active and get loud and get up there and tell people what's going on and how they need this change because this is you know something that they... Uh, it's important to their culture. It's important to their very survival. They, 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 they harvest the salmon. They eat the salmon. They sell the salmon. And they guide people to fish for salmon. They need this, this fishery to be as undisturbed as possible. And it turns out that these dams are not producing a whole lot of power anymore. Um, the company, Pacific Core, says, you know, 2%, something like that. Yeah, they, of, they of the don't, power they sell they, 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 is coming from these. They produce a surprisingly small amount of power. I know um, I used to work at a dam in Manchester, and we would give tours of the dam, and it was a uh, dam that was ooh, about uh, 30 feet tall and 700 feet, feet across, had three uh, penstocks and turbines, and it produced enough power for 15,000 homes, which sounds like a lot, but that's the same as the mall. Right, so it's <laughs> it's not as much oh, as you right. think, right? So it's it's not producing as much as you might hope for. So the the power generation is relatively low compared to what the damage it does uh, it messes up not just fish migration, but it warms the rivers in a way that makes it uninhabitable for some of the native fish, fishes. Exactly. What what did um, our our friend from Rhode Island Trout Unlimited, Glenn Glenn Place? Uh, called it a thermal refuge is what it's called. That's right. and, and yeah, it, it raises that temperature. It just screws stuff up. And it's a kind of a way, let's give this back, not just to the First Nation people, although they're top on the list of people who got screwed over the most by this, but the rest of us that right. love fish, that love fishing, that love nature. And we want this stuff, you know, it, it's right. not absolutely necessary. And this dam is, these, this series of dams is not necessary anymore. We've got other ways to provide what they were providing. Well, anyway, we, I put, we don't always, John. And some of the things well, they provide that we don't talk about, and the reason some people are against dam removal, most people who are against dam removal don't care about the power it supplies. They care about the use, the water use. You know, so California is suffering a big drought, so holding that water back. Um, some people think it's going to allow more water for people to use, uh, not to mention recreation, because those dams provide these giant lakes for boating and other activities. So people who are against it, you know, don't care about the fish so much, but they care about their usage. And so there's some some conversation to have there. There is always a conversation to have, and we always got to, you know, look at that. And there's always going to, but there's also going to be winners and losers. Mm -hmm. And and. You know, there's plenty of places to water ski, I think, as opposed to, you know, something you can do a lot of places. Of course. And have just as much fun as opposed to uh, a traditional and ancient, uh, you know, a, a fish run that, that really makes us, I'm sorry, but I don't want to sound like a politician, but it makes us stronger as a country to have good, clean, natural outdoor areas. There's a extreme benefit of another kind to having these salmon run, you know, maybe, maybe right. the marine owner on the lake or the water ski rental guy. Yeah. They're, they're going to be bummed and sure. they're going to have to figure something and out. Homeowners and I'm all in favor too. of financially supporting these people while sure. they go find something else. Yeah. Buy them out. But well, John, I mean, the other thing that we're talking about, we always talk about salmon, right? And they are right. like the, the cuddly animal. They're like the, the animal we want to talk about the most because they attract attention. It's like a baby deer. They're just so cute. But <laughs> there are so many other migratory fish we never mentioned. Uh, that use these rivers. And so you have this kind of like an umbrella species. The salmon attracts the money. The salmon gets the federal funding. 
but the benefits go right down the watershed, right down the food chain to all the fish and other animals that use the river below them. So it, it's, it's all good. Uh, it's just, it is all good. Yeah. And I have a more detailed article in the show notes. So you'll, you can hear which two tribes are spearheading this thing. Uh, yes, about the plants and the smaller, you know, the, the small fish and the heck, the zooplankton, the whole way the whole thing is going to change and, and, and we are going to restore and we need to restore because right. this whole extractive, unsustainable type thinking has got to go away. Because one planet, one chance. That's right. right. I think. Well, in, uh, in you got anything in, else you want to hear? Well, I, um, in Maine, they re, they took a river out and to to restore the salmon, shad, and herring and sea lamprey population, and a lot of the locals were all against it. They were saying you can't do this. The sediment and the other factors won't allow this fish to come back, and they had all these reasons why it wouldn't work. Uh, guess how long it took the fish to come back? An hour. One season. <laughs> they yeah. came back right away. Yeah. Oh, look, a river. Let's go. And that's, that's right. I mean, the game. Well, I mean, just bringing, bringing Glenn Place up again, but listening to them, the, they had their little, you know, small dam that they removed. And while they were eating lunch, they saw brook trout try to go upstream right, oh, know, yeah, the, right after they the, got done. The, the fish want to be there. So perfect. All right. Good story. I think it's good All news. Right. I think it's good news. All right. Now, let's see. What do we got next, Mr. Groves? Well, let's talk about a teenager who got arrested for taping fish to ATMs. <laughs> yes, please. Let's talk this about is this important. person. Uh, this is a very important uh, story. And the, the question, <laughs> we're going to talk about the story here. I actually covered this on my local news. It made national news. This happened in Provo, Utah. A teenager was recently arrested and charged for taping fish to ATMs around town. Apparently... That's considered illegal in Utah. There is a law in the books <laughs> specifically <laughs> about taping fish to ATMs. Uh, the teenager's Instagram account, fish underscore bandit 84. Like I said again, at fish underscore bandit 84. I highly recommend you go to his uh, Instagram account. Gained a following of 52,000 people. Now, that's amazing to me, John. And well, it's awesome because that's like in X number, like 24 hours or whatever. Because right. his latest post had over 300,000 likes. Right. Well, here's an amazing thing about it, John. How many yeah. posts does he have? Like nine. He's barely started his Instagram account. I know. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's really funny because he he takes a, tapes a fish up, makes a little weird video, and you know you see his feet tapping. You might see him give the fingers to the, to the ATM machine, and then some like music playing on the background. It's really nothing to it. Uh, no, it, it's, yeah. it's, it's great. It, it's, look, I had mixed feelings. You, I still you, do. You, you you sent this to me, and at first, you know, I'm thinking of the tired mom or the busy person that just wants to get some cash, you mm -hmm. know. <laughs> and now they've got to deal with right. How do I get my cash? Because there's a there's a carp tape to this. Oh, and by the way, this this young person did not. He he bought these fish at the fish market. I'm not quite sure we got the crappie, but all the rest are are for sure from a fish market. I'm not sure because it was carp. He had a variety of fish, and, well, and one of them, the catfish, looked alive still. So I've seen well, I've seen catfish, carp, small mouth, I mean largemouth bass, rainbow trout, crappie. So a good variety of fishes as well. Well, I, he says you know no fish were harmed in the yeah. making of this. Well, so, so I, I hope it's true. I did reach out to him, John. I did hear back. I did talk to him. Okay. And he's not allowed to make a comment because he's pending, right. pending court coming up. <laughs> he, yes, he is suffering for his art. He is being <laughs> yeah. uh, you know uh, yeah, and that's the thing. It's just. I think it's it's brilliant in its own way. It's annoying in its own way. Um, sure. But, it's, and I don't understand it, really, because I'm not that artsy. I mean, I guess it's a slam on, you know, um, the relentless, uh, destructive, predatory capitalism or what have you and the institutions that support it. I don't know. <laughs> I somehow think it's not deep at all. OK. <laughs> I somehow think it's just a teenager who did something stupid did a posting <laughs> and got positive feedback on Instagram by getting thousands and thousands of, of recognitions and likes and all that. And I went, all right, well, I'll do that again. Um, I just think it was a stupid prank that grew a little bit outside of itself. By the way, he also got busted for taping a fish to a Provo police car. Uh, he as taped well. two or three fish to that <laughs> he sure car. Did. That was awesome. <laughs> he sure did. Um, I just am more impressed with that you can tape a fish to anything. 
That I just, was it. I was like, how is he doing? What kind of tape is this? Somebody yeah. ought to be grabbing this guy. It's duct tape. And like, yeah. our brand of duct tape is the best. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. What, what brand of duct tape is best for taping fish to uh, glass? Now we know. Yeah. We, now we, we know. Now, now, now we, we, know. we have our answers. Anyway, uh, I highly recommend you go on and check out fish underscore bandit 84. Uh, give us your opinion on whether you think, uh, make tag, tag the fish nerd nation in there while you do it. Give your opinion on whether you think it's it's good, bad, harmful, stupid, funny, or all of them. Which, by the way, I think it's all the things. Yeah. I think it's good, and, uh, yeah, bad, I, funny, and harmful. So, <laughs> yeah. which, which good art can, can bring that kind of emotion that's conceptual art. Yeah, you know, just give yeah. me a good good picture of a, a fish jumping like a good lure box from the '60s. You give me that kind of art, but right. other people love this conceptual stuff. Well, let me golly, ask you a question, I, John. You know. All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna sign a, you have an assignment now. Okay. I need you to tape a fish to something in a series, which means you have to tape multiple different kinds of fish to multiple somethings. What is the something you're going to choose to target for your fish taping assignment? Um. Wow, that's a tough one. You don't have that to actually so do tough. it, but you have to tell me which what you would choose. Well, you know, I tell you what what I would yeah. Do? So you're you're your something is bugging you, and the way you're going to express your dislike for that something is by taping a fish to it. What is that something? Wow. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're really you're really wanting to get me in trouble here. I, I can do. tell. Yeah, I can just go. tell you want to get me in trouble because yeah. you know, you know. So maybe I would, um, like. I might go down to the plaza <laughs> and those, those, you know, boutiques that sell them $500 dresses and yeah. all that $10,000 jewelry and such. I may, uh, may, 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 may take a knock at the one percenters and, and tape up some of their stuff. Yeah. And, I want to put uh fish on political signs. We were just, right oh, the primaries, brilliant. the primaries in New Hampshire just happened. I am so overwhelmed by politics right now. And yeah. I just want to go and tape a fish to every party. I don't care what party you're at. Right now, I'm bothered by you. I'm going to tape fish on you. That's where I'm at. All right, let's leave it there, John. Let's move on. Let's leave it alone and get on down the road because I got another fun one next. All right, hit it. Well, this is going to be a, a fast one, but I had to do this because of you, my ice fishing guide buddy. Last weekend, Wisconsin had a free fishing weekend trying to get people to go out and ice fish. Oh, we had the so, same thing here in New Hampshire and Maine last weekend. Wow. Well, yeah. Okay, then let's just do the collective. How many pairs of feet got froze, Clay? I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah, I didn't even what? go. I didn't even go fishing. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been ice fishing once this year, John. Oh my goodness, no! See, I, I know. I'm, I'm getting out this weekend for the first time. We've had a weird winter. Ice came in late, and then um, my mojo wasn't there when it came in. I just like, yeah, it's cold out. I don't feel like going outside. And I, <laughs> so I haven't been ice fishing yet, but this weekend I'm getting out there. But uh, but thousands of people t- take part in these free fishing days, and you know people still need to follow all the regulations and rules. I usually have a trip booked for free fishing day because people can book it without buying a license. They can save themselves fifteen bucks or whatever it is. Um, right. I love free fishing days. I wish they would do them more often. Well, I think it's a great thing, but I, I always, I just hope people have somebody experienced that's going to say, hey, this is, all, you know, how to dress, this is what you should wear on your feet, and so on. Although, as much as you advise clients and as much as people call in about the um, uh, the frozen feet and mm-hmm. all that, um, we had the frozen frozen toes um, thing from Joe at Laughing right. Apple. And, uh, yeah, so it sometimes, no matter how much information you put out there, uh, people end up getting in trouble, but you know, Wisconsin's one of those places where the ice is, is awful thick. They know, so, they know how to be warm. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. you, well, and you gotta, you know, so you're not going to just go out there with a, you know, I don't know. Or if, maybe you, you know, will. Imp- I mean, John, improvise. You, you can improvise out on a small pond and when you get cold, you can just stop fishing. Like right. you're, you're not obligated to stay out there till you die. You can well, see, and that's just can, it. I'm thinking of Wisconsin. You got to go out on a big lake, but they yeah, have there's thousands they of have, lakes. Yes, they have places of all sizes yeah. there. So that is a good point. Yes, yeah, indeed. you don't have to get stuck in the middle of a frozen lake for six hours. You can fish for an hour on a free fishing day and go. Okay, I did it. I'm done. I, <laughs> I like that. I don't a, like that's it. the beauty of it. I offer two hour long fishing trips, and so I can stack up people who are brand new at fishing, aren't comfortable with being on the ice, and just want a taste of it. And they just they come out off the ice. By the time they catch a fish, they're done. That's it. Yeah. So they don't well, get that cold. Know, yeah. 
and I'm all for him. Take it as you want to take it. You don't have to be nuts like me. Yeah. Uh, so everybody most everybody do your thing. We most, still will uh, enjoy seeing you out there. Most states who have free ice fishing days also have a free uh, open water fishing day as well. Yes. Six months apart. Usually it's January and June. So there it is. Good. Right. Good. I'm a big supporter of free fishing days. Yeah. Is there more too. news? Me too. No. Yeah. Now here's the big one. Here's the one. This one has to do with crime. This one has Uh to do with corruption. This one has to do with a shady company. This one has to do with the species being pushed to extinction. All kinds of things going on with advocates say a Mexican startup is illegally selling a health drink made from an endangered fish. Uh Uh-oh. What's the fish? And what's the The fish? Is a, a, a type of a drum in the drum family. It's a Mexican fish. Called the Totoa, all right, the Totoaba, or the Totoaba, but Totoaba is is I think the best way to pronounce mm-hmm. it. So. Good luck on that. Well, you know, you look up these pronunciation things online, and a lot of times it's just some person phonetically sounding out a Spanish word or a right. French word, and it's like that's not right. <laughs> the know, the company like, is called Blue Formula. Is that right? Yeah. Does that sound right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, I can't even remember the, the company. Uh, Blue. Yeah. Yeah. Blue yeah. Formula. And they're, they're making this drink. And supposedly it's the it's the it's the uh, collagen or the, the you know, the cartilage thing like the like the shark pills and the, you know, people doing that sort of a thing. Right. But what is going on here is that the Totoaba or the Totoaba <laughs> is actually used also in. Dun, 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 Chinese traditional medicine. Oh, and yep. they used to use a fish that lived in China called the Bahaba, but they've pushed that to the edge of extinction and they can't find it anymore very in quantity. And they make some sort of thing out of its bladder. I assume it has to do something with male sexuality. It always does, it. John. It always does. I, that's yes, because yep. it always does. Yep. But dude, how much do you think? One bladder out of a fair-sized Totoaba would sell for. Oh, value? Yeah, $20, well, how, $200, $2,000, $20,000, $20,000. I bet it's $2,000. $2,000. $20,000. For one? They, just, they busted somebody with 200 of them, and the Good value Lord. was like $3 million bucks. It's amazing so, because you can farm these fish, John. Yes, and this and company the, claims that they are farming them. Yeah. Um. You know, to create nature's best kept secret, a little sachet of powder containing Mm -hmm. collagen taken from this fish that you mix into a drink. But there is so much going on here in that, you know, we have a trade on international trade and we have have a, excuse me, a treaty on international trade and endangered species with Mexico. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you think enforcement here is a problem. It's a huge problem down there for a variety of reasons. Um, the biggest so reason, the, the ocean is very big. You can't find everybody. Well, <laughs> so how do you keep track of it all? The, 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 the Totoaba, the Totoaba <laughs> is, is lost a lot of its spawning ground because we've jacked up the Colorado River. Uh, a lot of years it doesn't even make it to the ocean. The Delta mm-hmm. doesn't run any water because it's all been sold out to people, you know, down the pipe and and states are continuously fighting over the water in the in the uh, colorado river well the 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 toaba needs the water with a lighter salinity than in in the pacific in general to uh successfully spawn so that's one problem it's having and one reason it's getting rare but people are like you know this advocacy group is kind of like collagen my patoot you know we're talking about bladders that are worth 20 grand a piece and also, why does grinding all this stuff up into a small sachet of powder? Because if you were to take a whole Totoba and ship it somewhere, you'd be breaking an international law. It'd be a federal offense. Right. But how can so how can this company just grind it up and turn it into a, a what we call a value added product? Well, it's it's because they claim it's 100 percent farm raised, and that the 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 law does allow for farm raised these farm raised fish to be used and marketed. So well, they claim it's and they, and they they there's the sneaky part is you can't tell a farm raised totoaba from a wild one. In fact, the farms that raise them release a percentage of the ones they raise into the wild to help b- bring the population back. So the genetics are the same. 
Yes. And, and if any of this is true, good for them because, uh, you know, they need help keeping this species uh, on its feet. But the Cetacean Action Treasury first cited the company in November and a coalition of environmental charities, the Center for Bio of Biological the Center for Biological Diversity, National Resources Defense Council, and Animal, the Animal Welfare Institute, they have filed a written complaint uh, to CITES because on behalf, you know, the, that's mm -hmm. the treaty, CITES uh, agency, and, and because they are extremely suspicious. Apparently, this company is not transparent, is not communicative, is making all these claims that, oh, yeah, we're raising the fish in a farm, and then we're releasing some back into the wild to do our part. And what's the word for that, Clay? Uh, you remember from Meg Carney? No. Green. Greenwashing. 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 Yes. So, you know, like when the people down in Florida want to raise salmon in a semi-tropical state and say, but we're using the cleanest water. Mm -hmm. you know, we, we bought this spring, which I'm just like, great, one less beautiful Florida spring to look at. Uh, and it's just going to be completely the most wonderful thing on earth. Well, that remains to be seen. It re very much remains to be seen here because we're talking, you know, uh, I don't know how much you're going to make off their, you know, blue formula is going to make off their little powder, um, you know, but when, you know, we all know that, out the front door, you're running a little bodega in a major city, and out the back door, you're selling the heavy drug, right? Right. Well, you got to make you know? money somewhere, John. Right. <laughs> ah, you know. But I just, I just see my my cynicism. I'm just like, hey, you know, you got these bladders are worth twenty k a piece, um, and you're telling me you're grinding up their bones or whatnot to get the collagen, you know? Well, which can be gotten from other well, and, and a, lot of, and, a lot of fish have the same and, type and, of collagen. And, and you know what, John? That probably does nothing. Like most health supplements, it's all it's all snake oil. It's all pretend, uh, yeah. And it, it's just marketing. It's all it is. So why don't we well, why don't we kill that story? Because that is well, awful. I, it is awful. And before we kill the story, let's not kill the Valkita porpoise because oh, yes. this poor thing is on at the edge. I'm glad you brought that up. And of of extinction, and if this company and the success of the company and the knowledge that this company is looking for these products off of this fish is causing people to start using gill nets in these areas where the Valkita is barely hanging on. It could wipe it out. Right. So that's because they get stuck in the gill nets, right? Yeah. They get yeah. tangled in the gill nets. It's, it's, it hurts to look at these pictures. It literally hurts. I mean, I'm a cuteness freak and these are the cutest little porpoises you ever did see. You talk about poster child. You talk about wanting to just, you know, go commando and go on down there and take over the whole place. But, you know, anyhow, that, I just wanted to get that in. This There's a lot to this. Uh, there's I put two links down in the show notes, one so you can learn more about the Totoaba and one about the, the one I'm working from here from U.S. News um, so you can read about the company blue formula all, all right let's get you, on out john, of here, for, thank you john for bringing that story to our attention all right so you yeah bet. don't eat any kind of weird fish supplement you don't need it anyway <laughs> let's end the news there <laughs> no no news, news, fish in the news. Everybody loves their fish in the news. all right john tell us about what we're doing with doc martin today well you know Doc Martin, she uh, is our wonderful science correspondent, and she finds some of the funnest people you ever want to meet, and they are super nerds, and this next story is no exception. We've got Clint and Jason from the Kansas Department of Health and Environment. They're going to talk about how fish kills and analyzing fish kills and so forth is part of their job, which overall is to protect the water quality in Kansas. So join us right now with Doc, Clint, and Jason, and might I ask you to turn it up. Yeah. 
It's Doc Martin. I am really excited to be talking to you guys today. I have two fantastic guests that I am elated to introduce you to. Um, so Clint and Jason, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and Clint, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and then Jason, you can be next. Okay, I'm Clint Goodrich with KDHE's Watershed Management Section. And what does KDHE stand for since we have a lot of out-of-state listeners? Excuse me, Kansas <laughs> Department of Health and Environment. And I manage our 319 program. And that is a program through EPA's Clean Water Act. And my job is to clean up water quality in Kansas. My name is Jason Kuntz, and I uh, work directly under Clint. I am a project officer for our RAPS program, which is the Watershed and Rest Restoration and Protection Strategy. We uh, work in various watersheds just uh, to uh, improve the water quality within those watersheds. And I am also the Fish Kills Coordinator for KDHE, Kansas Department of Health and Environment. And so we respond to various uh, fish kills uh, or, and uh, determine whether or not, you know, determine their causes and if there's further investigation to be done. Cool. Uh, well, thank you for taking time out of your day to join us here on the Fish Nerds podcast. And just um, for the listeners who maybe aren't familiar with KDHE or what you guys do, do so what is your background and how did you end up here and we'll go in the same order as before so clint first well first of all i started out in fisheries in ancient days um before anybody even knew what a podcast was and it's a long and winding road that got me to this job but somehow i've always remained tied to fish <laughs> and i just can't get away from it. They're pretty cool. They are cool. They are cool. <laughs> um, so um, right now I see my job is trying to uh, uh, fix our state's water quality problems um, from a non-point source perspective, which is our biggest water quality issue through doing best management practices in agriculture. And so so there's point and non-point source pollution. Mm -hmm. And so what are some examples of the non-point source pollutions that you deal with? Um, well, what I've learned since uh, taking this job is that we don't so much have a water quality problem as we have a soil health problem and fixing our soils through innovative farming practices is what's going to solve our water quality problems. Cool. Um, and so, Jason, how did you end up where you are? <laughs> I'm sure my road road uh, path to where I am now isn't quite as circuitous as his, but <laughs> I uh, I I don't know I yeah I uh, kind of say my start comes uh, you know, when I went to Haskell uh, Haskell Indian Nations University in Lawrence, and I got um, you know really interested in um, wetlands. And, uh, you know, and just protecting the environment. So I, after that, you know, went and graduated went to uh, KU and I, uh, you know, went to work for a, a, a researcher named Donald Huggins, who, uh, you know, got me into wetlands and water quality monitoring. And I did various things there under him. Um, you know, we did some wetland sampling surveys for the the national uh wetland study or the wetland survey that epa puts on i think every four years four to five years and yeah i worked in the lab also uh i was the chlorophyll a guy um, ran the fluorometer and yeah so i i've always as far as the fish relationship goes um i you know my dad was an avid fisherman i was not i was the kid that was always uh you know, making noise, throwing rocks and wandering off. And so I learned a lot about fish through him and, you know, uh, maybe not all the right terms uh, by, you know, by what an angler might consider, you know, the names of fish. But, you know, I did learn a lot about fish in that aspect. I did a little bit of fish work with Don, but, you know, not a whole lot. So and um, I came to the state and I actually went into the hazardous waste section. Hazardous Waste Program, 
which I uh, had oversight of some facilities and that had groundwater problems. But the thing about groundwater is that it also can be connected to surface water. So a lot of the facilities that I had were next to rivers, streams, mostly. And, you know, they hired me because of my knowledge of the surface water. And I did have an understanding of that connectivity. So, yeah, I was really always been concerned about the water quality and the and the the fish and the other animals and plants that are there. So that's where I am. And, you know, I kind of got, I didn't really know that I was going to become the fish kills coordinator when I took this job on, when I came in on in January, but it's, it's actually been kind of fun, you know, even though it's. How did that happen? I forget. <laughs> did I just say, Hey, Jason, you're going to do this now? Yeah, it was like that's that. Right. And I was like, well, I don't know if you're picking the right guy because I've forgotten basically everything I've ever learned about fish yeah. at this point. I saw his resume. It had fish stuff on there. And I was actually at that same shop with Don Huggins, too. And I was their fish taxonomist back mm -hmm. once upon a time. But I got more locked into the lab and the data yeah. side of things and calling people to get permissions. I really I enjoyed that quite a bit talking to uh, landowners because mm -hmm. I, I felt really proud of myself for convincing them to let us come on their land to do the, the to do the surveys. And I was like, and, you know, because we did have to divulge, divulge that they, that we, uh, you know, we are working through funding with the EPA. So and we have to be very transparent in that respect and get the, you know, the permissions and have the access. And it's really nice that people, you know, are interested in what we do a lot of times and they want us, they want to see improvements. I digress there. <laughs> just, uh, just remembering some of the other things that I did there, you know, you know, I thought I'd be playing in wetlands, you know, for the rest of my <laughs> life and just collecting samples and things, but you know, you know, you end up in different positions, but it's okay. You still have a kind of a connection to those, those things. And um, I do have one follow-up question about chlorophyll, and that is if you call it borophyll ever. <laughs> I have. Well, I do, actually, because my friend and I, we were in a band together, and we used to go out. But there was a band that was playing one night, and we were a little bit tipsy. And so he just pops out of nowhere and says chlorophyll more like a borophyll like and it was quiet the song had just ended or whatever and I thought we were run out of there you know like they they were just dirty looks <laughs> anyway so i go around saying that a lot of times when i'm like you know when something might get a little boring you know like chlorophyll Anyway, I yeah, name sorry. yeah I name all my um, chlorophyll spreadsheets borophyll. So, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, um, chlorophyll is not boring, by the way. Very not boring. Yeah, I will agree. Fine. Yeah. But with that, so we can just start with fish kill stuff. You kind of already touched on that a little bit. So uh, I guess step number one is what is a fish kill? How do you know that that has happened? Mm. Didn't we discuss it's not one or two dead gizzard shad that doesn't count right three though is the break there's a, yeah, there's a threshold there somewhere and jason will tell us all about it. well we have a plan and we have some you know a handbook and this this the statement we in the beginning of the book in the the plan it says what someone else has written it says fish kills are localized die-offs of any number of fish any but number over a period of time i added that on later because i'm like yeah of course it's over a period of time but Fish kills can happen overnight. They can happen all throughout the day. You know, there could be a time length. So I think that is important and to be able to observe the kill itself and what the fish are doing is we don't always actually show up whenever they're actually dying or and I'll say we because it's actually <laughs> the district staff who usually show up to investigate or, you know, respond to the, any fish kill. But as far as fish, you know, it's like, Anywhere from a dozen to hundreds of thousands of fish. And so the number, you know, how many and where becomes important to assessing whether is that a really large impact and is it going to be, is it something we have to be concerned about for our safety and the other that the ecosystem there also because you know, some of the, it depends on what the cause is, what's the source. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that actually segues really nicely into what are some of the common causes of fish kills? And some might be 
more worry inducing than others and some are like that's just the cycle so what causes fish kills i think what we're seeing uh, most of the time is a sudden influx of nutrients mm -hmm. that nitrogens and phosphorus is right yeah. okay and that jacks up the the productivity of the system and then we get do crashes from all the new plant life, algae, mm -hmm. uh, phytoplankton. So, yeah, dissolved oxygen. Yep. Yep. And so, sorry. That's okay. We got so, used to just saying DO, jargon. Like to define yeah. things. There and you so go. My fun, fun fact one of my favorite facts that a lot of people forget uh, because why would you remember this unless you're dealing with it? I don't know. But um, we all know that plants photosynthesize mm -hmm. and animals undergo cellular respiration, mm -hmm. right? But plants do respiration too. Yeah. And that is probably what you're getting at, right? Right. Yeah. We get a big buildup of algae. And then when they go to breathe, they just like us use up oxygen and there's none left for the fish and and then a fish kill happens but we're also seeing more extended droughts and dry periods and our weather seems to be getting more erratic the heavy the heavy heat. rains you know don't don't often see those nice days anymore where it rains for three days it all comes at once mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in a couple hours flushes those nutrients in so because yeah, if you have the rain has time to percolate through the soil, you're not getting that buildup of that water just rushing that topsoil into the stream. And of course, on the topsoil is where you put fertilizers in your lawn or in agriculture. And when all that water dumps at once, I mean, you've done this with your kitchen sink, right? If you have it on spray and you just turn it on, then it floods, but you can put a drip or a sieve under there. And it's the same amount of water, but you spread it over either time or area or something. It makes a huge difference of how that water plays with the soil and then goes into the stream. Precisely. And that's um, Jason and I's other job is trying to <laughs> do cost share programs uh, in targeted areas to address water quality issues that can result in fish kills mm -hmm. through soil health practices. And that's really what we got to fix to solve this problem. So, Anything else you'd like to add about what causes fish kills? Well, a lot of them happen, you know, in the summer months when it's hot, you know, it's the heat, the low water, low dissolved oxygen. And then, you know, you know what he said, the eutrophication of a lot of our water bodies. Um, but, you know, there are other things that happen, you know, other pollution sources. Sometimes there are spills, transportation, highway spills, stuff will go into the ditch and that ditch leads to a, a you know, a creek and then that creek leads to a river. But sometimes those you know, those ditches lead to other people's ponds. And so it affects private owners and public waterways all the same. And then releases from facilities that could either add nutrients or other contaminants or uh, infectious diseases to the water that could affect the fish population. Some of, or like in the nutrient sense, you know, it could quickly, you know, produce a bloom of some sort, and then that die-off would cause the low oxygen to happen, just like he, he uh, alluded to. Other, um, in the wintertime, he, he reminded me of this too, there's sometimes there are winter fish kills, but that's related to the dissolved oxygen uh, concentration mm -hmm. because when the ice forms the sheet over the top of water, the oxygen can't penetrate through into the water. And so he says a lot of gizzards shed have winter, died that winter way. Kill, yeah. But I haven't experienced that one yet, so... Fingers crossed. And so I'm, I'm going to ask a question that uh, all of our listeners are going to want to know when you said that there's facilities that release infectious diseases into the streams. Uh, what is that about? Oh, goodness. I'm going to get myself in trouble. You might have to cut this part out. Okay. Today. So I guess if you would say, okay, not that they're doing it on purpose, but sometimes you have, if you had a combined sewer system at a, in a, at a oh, city, okay. and then those, that combined sewer system, if there's a large rain event mm -hmm. it becomes overflowed and they combine and then it's not treated properly and then that's the release it's so that's not like an e coli it's, like it's not thing? yes it's yeah. not an intentional okay. thing yeah. so i think i would imagine most of us have heard combined sewer overflow and boiling advisories and that kind right. of right when there's so a heavy rain event yeah that's, okay. so sometimes a fish kill can help us determine whether we need to have a boil advisory oh, okay or, you know kind of thing so there may be private owners who have accidental releases just based on the activities that they're having. And those become, even though we might not think of them as point sources at the time, when we determine that there's been some mistakes, then, you know, that party may have to 
address them in some way uh, or another. Uh, we, we've seen, we, uh, oops, go ahead. Seen one of uh, a large fish kill from an ammonia pipe pipeline break. Yeah, once upon a time, uh, and that was a pretty impressive fish kill. And uh, that one, I believe, even killed birds. Oh my gosh! So much ammonia is being released. Yeah. Oh, uh, so we talked a little bit about what causes fish kills, and that it's it's any number of fish over a given amount of time where they're both very wonderfully ambiguous variables. So when you go and you get a call from maybe a private citizen or someone within your office saying, Hey, there's probably a fish kill over here. Someone's going to go out and quantify it in some way. What, what kinds of things do you quantify about those fish kills? Uh, probably, you know, first off, we kind of, we want to get an estimation of the number killed and, Generally, a lot of people just, you know, kind of count what they see on the surface, though there are other methods that are more involved. KDHE's response to a fish kill is typically driven by whether or not there's a potential source, you know, involved in causing that fish kill. Like, ob- lot, like obvious up front? You well, mean, something or? like a smell or odor oh, okay. or something that you see, discoloration in the water, a sheen, the way that the fish act. So when someone calls in a fish kill, I try to get all the information I can to get the be- understand the behavior of the fish, what kind of fish are there, like large fish, small fish, because some of them are more sensitive to like dissolved oxygen conditions. And some, so you may have some fish that die and you're like, well, that's a larger fish and it demands a higher amount of oxygen to sustain itself in that water column where you have smaller fish like minnows and mainly minnows and, you know, other, I don't know what other small fish or maybe even juvenile fish would survive if they don't need, have that great oxygen. mean, within a, if that, if that keel was caused by, uh, the low dissolved oxygen mm-hmm. circumstance. However, like when you see, if someone reports to me that all the fish died, like every species, like type carp, of species, which are really- carp, gar, mm-hmm. you know, gar is really alarming because they're very hardy. Mm-hmm. And then if uh, uh, turtles, raccoons or deer or anything like yeah. that are, are have died, then we know that that might be, that elevates it to maybe there's a potential something else involved. Like maybe maybe someone applied a, herbicide some kind of pesticide the night before and then it rained because a lot of times these the fish kills that i've noticed over this last year that there would be a rain event either two or three days prior and it takes a long like you got to think of water and contamination moving kind of together in like a slug it kind of travels down and maybe some of it dissipates and dissolve uh, and it gets dissolved or you know diluted but a lot of times it doesn't. It just kind of stays in that slug and it moves down the stream or river or into a lake. And then if there are fish in that in that area where that that slug of contamination passed through, they could they may, they may be killed by that contamination. If there's a lot of uh, nutrients in a in a, wa- a a slug of water moving down the stream because there's all that bacteria degrading and using up all the oxygen kind of passes through their area and they may be killed from the low dissolved oxygen there. So I was, I was, so when I, I got a call, you know, they, I tell, I think we asked the temperature, how's it hot? And I'm really geographically challenged with Kansas because I'm from Oklahoma. So, sorry, listeners. <laughs> um, but uh, most of them are not from Kansas. Either, so, so okay. <laughs> you know, I, you know, I've had some trouble knowing which way the water is flowing. So I have to be real careful that. So I have to actually ask people like which way the water is flowing or, you know, that kind mm-hmm. of thing or, or how much of the flow is it like, no, I know they don't know the exact amount, but they can tell me, oh, the water is moving really slow. It's very low. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times we can, you know, determine that the cause is main, isn't really something we need to investigate because we, just, but we can, re, we do like to respond to it and then, you know, kind of give the, uh, the person reporting the fish kill an idea of what could have caused it mm-hmm. and how much if it's safe. Is it safe to go into the water? Is it, can I fish, you know, like, you know, cause that's what people want to know. Right? And I, They're like, there's a bunch of dead stuff here. Am yeah. I going to be the dead stuff yeah. or what? <laughs> this is a warning. Just don't go in there. I would advise anyone to, you know, if you do see a fish kill, you know, to 
you know, don't go into the water. Right. I mean, if you can get close to observe the fish behavior or to see Safely, see yes. a fish <laughs> and what its condition is, you may be because it may be there may be abnormalities or lesions mm-hmm. or things like that. It could be caused from you know disease, mm-hmm. and if it, especially if it's affecting just one fish. So. I'm trying to think what other information, location, where are you at, you know, mm-hmm. what river are you on? And sometimes that's, you know, you, we have to do a little tracking down because we get a little, I'll get an email or I'll get it. They have to kind of figure out where it is and who, and I got to figure out who I need to call to respond to that, mm-hmm. that fish kill. Regardless of what the, the information I get, I always send out a correspondence to the district office Mm-hmm. And then to any other partner we have, like Who's KDWP, the KDT district office, or the KDWP folks will email us and tell us that they've been, a, a fish kill has been reported to them. And I, I can tell you, I'm not with KDHE or KDWP. I get those calls. So, yeah, <laughs> you get those calls, you can call us and, I, and then we'll, or you call your district office mm-hmm. and then, because they're the closest person, uh, close yeah, staff to respond mm-hmm. to that. And they, they may not always respond. It also it, it depends on our resources. Who's ava- if we have people available. Private ponds we typically don't respond to, or they don't respond to. It, we typically refer them to the Kansas State University Pollution Prevention Institute website. They have a small business environmental assistance program. Okay, so for the so, private pond yeah. and landowners, and that's you can nice. find and they just so they kind of tell you, kind of help you manage your pond better and okay yeah and also on there and just as a note you know at the on that website you'll find a link to the kdhe harmful algal blooms webpage and their reporting because sometimes there may be a bloom that's involved that caused the fish kill or i might add with go the, ahead yeah. with the quantification question um it kind of depends on how how intensely we we quantify the amount of fish that are dead, mm-hmm. the kinds of fish are dead on the cause. The vast majority, we just determine it's natural, mm-hmm. big rain sure. event. It's, it's August. All doctrine. Yeah, it's August. <laughs> um, there's agriculture around. Mm-hmm. It's expected. It's going to happen. But for some sort of spill or something mm-hmm. like that, we we'll, may actually follow up and look at other aquatic life, like macroinvertebrates. And in some cases, KDWP will come in and actually count all the sport fish. Mm-hmm. And because if there's a, an at-fault party, then they can do a damage assessment and they mm-hmm. put a monetary value on those fish and wildlife and can then sue that company or entity to get that money back. And I've seen that happen. It's pretty rarely, but it, I've seen it happen before. But that's a pr- those are pretty rare cases. That's That's a good... Uh, reminder to me because I forgot one of the most important parts. If it does go that far and there is an investigation and a party, potential party, we, we know the the staff do have to sample the water, yep. you know, for whatever that potential chemical might be. Like if there's a sheen, it might be uh, oil, gas, a fuel. So we'd want to run a VOC sample. We would want to collect one of those. And do you and, remember what VSD uh, stands for? Volatile organic carbon. Okay, all right. Uh, let's see, do I remember? Yeah. Well, that's, uh, there's a lot of uh, I know, yeah. me using acronyms, and I'm like, it's something, something, and two yeah, more letters. Sure. <laughs> so, yeah, for those of us who love fish and and we get angry when we hear some entity has killed fish through negligence or <laughs> whatever, then, uh, yeah, we have a way to help recoup that cost, and we can... Yeah. Justice and, has been served. So. And Clint, Clint cares more about the large fish, and I care more about the small fish. But, oh. but he's, con- <laughs> he's convinced me that the large fish are uh, worth caring about, too. Because, <laughs> Between you and I, we're right. Because, because <laughs> you know, the the larger game fish are the ones that, you know, carry the little the eggs and stuff for the, mm-hmm. the, the mussels, right? Well, Aren't they know, the transport, right? My original master's. <laughs> thesis work was going to be on the horny head chub and i thought i was the only person on the planet that cared about the horny head chub oh those are like super popular yeah yeah cool fish in, in kansas right? well you know, <laughs> people are like oh what yeah it just goes in does the, the that gets chucked in the minnow bin <laughs> yeah <laughs> so many so many good fish do. <laughs> um okay so 
I think we'll go ahead. We talked a little bit about some of the fish kills that you guys have experienced and some examples. Um, is there any like the the most unusual or memorable or just puzzling or any fish kill stories you'd like to share? The most mm. puzzling for me was in gill netting days, finding a, I think it was about a 50 inch grass carp just leaning dead against a one inch gill net. Just leaning? Just like it just couldn't figure out how to go around huh. and exhausted itself. It was the only thing we could figure. And we thought that was not a very smart fish. That's only one fish. Does that count as a fish kill? It says fish? any number of fish. In the and it was caused by humans, me in particular, with a gill net. That yeah, but it, there wouldn't be a whole lot of response to okay. that. Probably not a whole lot of response not to that. Not a whole lot of response. But maybe some, some light shaming from colleagues. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, I, speaking of which, I had some light shaming done to me in the beginning because there was a report of a fish kill at a private pond, and it was 30 goldfish. Jason's not aware of all the shaming we do when he's not in on. <laughs> so, it's extreme when you're not looking. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to do my due diligence, and I'm contacting everyone to, oh, my gosh, there's a fish kill at this pond in land. Dirty goldfish and private pond. <laughs> so. Calm down, they say it. They say my, <laughs> my first fish kill response as a KDG person, um, we went to go investigate and there was dead fish all over. It was in a it was in a creek from a spill. Mm -hmm. And I was behind the ears and following my new boss. And of course he's looking all around the landscape and kind of taking in everything and yeah, not watching where his feet are, and he steps on a dead carp, <laughs> oh. and it was the classic um, uh, step on a banana peel, just like in Looney Tunes or cartoon, you know. Mm -hmm. And he went feet in the air and landed smack on top of that dead carp. I couldn't help it; I laughed. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought I was going to get fired on the spot. This was like my first week getting <laughs> you, but I, but I survived and. You're still here. He retired and we're still buddies, but that's one of the dangers of investigating fish kills is slipping on dead fish. Yeah. Well, I'm glad he was actually looking around to observe the surroundings because of, you know, there's clues there too. Like sometimes the vegetation is dead and sometimes the, you know, there are other things you have to be aware of. I don't know. Clues. Looking for clues. <laughs> That's right. Um, is there anything else that you guys would like to add before we wrap up? Jason? <laughs> well, I know fish kills are, you know, they're very, they're obvious whenever they're, they're seen by, you know, a, you know, a citizen and they're, they're kind of a, a symptom or a evidence of an acute situation. However, it's all the things that I've learned about, you know, aquatic ecosystems you know made me brought me to be really concerned about you know the the, the chronic contamination that is in, in impacting our streams the stuff that we don't necessarily see you know through a fish kill or through something some other obvious effect like a, a harmful algal bloom or something but i'm glad to see that there are fish there still that we can observe but you know some of some of the fish populations, have, you know, suffer quite a bit from the, the chronic chemical encounters or, you know, what's being put out there that it may affect their reproductive uh, success. So just because you see, you know, you can see the larger fish in the kill. Sometimes you don't see the smaller fish and there are other, you know, I just kind of want people to be aware of the fact that. There's you know, things that, that can harm the yeah. fish that don't kill the fish yeah and so, it's more of a long-term situation where it's like the population trends over time yeah. are being detrimentally harmed but the level of contamination might not be high yeah so it's not that acute instantaneous oh shit situation right mm -hmm. um it's the little bit of a background that kind of can slide under the radar that yeah. maybe is a bit more concerned so i you know yeah, I, I want people to be cautious of around their ditches and creeks and things whenever yeah, because i live near a creek and i've had to rescue uh oil someone did an oil change and just oh. put a box that box into the, the 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 ditch and i'm like I, now i can't allow that to happen mm -hmm. because i live right there on the creek so 
yeah so we need to all be mindful of the, the smaller streams that lead into the larger streams because those are the the nurseries for a lot of the fish that we we want to catch mm-hmm. and the smaller fish are food for the larger fish we want to catch and mm-hmm. so i think it's wendell berry that says do unto those downstream as you would have those do upstream do unto you <laughs> <laughs> all right that's a good way to say it yeah but yeah so that's you know that's the only other thing i really wanted to add thank you any Pat. final thoughts Clint? um if a fish kill happens and no one's there to see it <laughs> does it really happen i mean what are we going to do to um well, as far oh, as KDG is what, concerned, I guess it we, didn't happen. <laughs> we kind of had this discussion, I think, uh, how are we, you know, someone asked, are we seeing increasing trends of more fish kills? And mm-hmm. um, one of our problems in Kansas is a report came out of KU that we have maybe around 300,000 artificial bodies of water in the state, farm ponds and other lakes and impoundments. Um, and most of those are not being observed by anybody. How would we know if we're seeing increases in fish kills when most of them probably are not observed? Are we, we going to look at the data at some point? Thing, I mean, and try to figure out if there's a trend or or we also they're they're more at the forefront, I think, now in people's consciousness. So maybe they're getting reported more often. And, and there's been a lot of push. I know um, several agencies here in Kansas are trying to get more people outside to go to the outdoors. Well, if you're doing that, you have more eyes mm. on those things that are not usually seen. So do you have an increase because there's an actual increase in fish kills? Or is it just you have more people enjoying nature? That's right. That's hard. That's hard. And the data set is sparse. And I think mm-hmm. maybe unpredictable might be a fair term to describe it is right. so what do you do? What do you do with that? What kind of conclusions can you really some make? Some may not yeah. get reported. Um, mm-hmm. So I might not have my, the correct numbers or the my, fish are not identified. My feeling is mm-hmm. that they're getting more becoming more frequent through time. Mm-hmm. But that's just a feeling. It's not science or numbers so i mean i did bring a little bit of data a little bit of data that we could look at but you know if we you know i don't know if you guys want to briefly check it out do you want to show your data uh we could, we could, let's see let's see what i got here okay. so we love data just just in the last year over 2020 2023 we had 19 fish kills reported reported reported, reported. Mm-hmm. there might have been one that i missed it was a private pond uh, the largest of those was in a lake. The largest kill was in the lake. Is 150 plus uh, individuals, and they were mostly gizzard chad. Mm-hmm. That one was kind of sad because it was right before a fishing tournament. Didn't oh. that happen? And it had a lot of it has eutrophic problems. So, is it 150 or 150 thousand? Oh wait, 150 thousand. Okay. Sorry, did I say? Did I leave out the thousand? You, you said 150 plus. <laughs> oh, oh, 150 thousand so, plus. Technically, it is over 150, which is great. Well, yeah, technically, yeah. So, you know, um, most of those, yeah, most of those kills were in ponds or lakes. Mm-hmm. So more than half, I think. And, and you it, think that's the nutrient problem, which is just pretty typical. Yeah, nothing. Yeah. There's nothing like overly concerning. It's just. Mm late summer and it's hot yeah yeah um and then you know there were a few in a couple of rivers and a couple of creeks mm-hmm. and those numbers range from you know five to a hundred uh let's see 500 so, okay so and um most of the ones with the lower numbers i don't think had a, a full investigation i mean we might have had a response to do you um, think, I'm sorry. I just sorry. had a question. So some folks, uh, when they go fishing, sometimes they will kill the fish and leave them, throw them up on the bank. Do you think you ever get reports of fish kills where it's actually just like that kind of a thing? The the fish aren't dying because of environmental contamination. They're dying because maybe an angler isn't you know, treating fish nicely. We do have a this um information on that okay. um, let's see back I, in my fisheries recreation days. water related yeah. activity we do so we have four okay yeah so not very many but a couple I remember a couple instances where after doing gill netting surveys in the big reservoirs 
we would just put the fish back in the lake and not many fish survived gill netting and then someone else comes along and oh there's a hundred dead fish back in this cove and I get a call and like, yeah it was us we're just counting fish mm-hmm. lethally but yeah. so I don't know what the question was exactly about the data but I had put together uh, you know we have a data set Mm-hmm. And I was trying to evaluate it for we have a training that's part of one of my duties as a fiscal coordinator is that I have to provide training to the district staff because the fiscals don't happen off. You know, they're so sparse and sporadic between the times and the frequencies that we have to train quite often to be to refresh. But I put this data together for them last year in our training. and so. You know, we had about, let's see, 1,454 events over that period of time. What's the period of time? Sorry. 1978 to 2022. Oh, wow. So that's a pretty substantial period of time. Yeah. So we've had like over 1,500 events with over, oh, let's see, 4 million dead fish. But of those, you know, 75% of those kills are determined to be natural. Mm-hmm. So 30% be caused by human, something, you know, some incident, okay. or something that could be traced back to man. And hmm. for those events, like I've divided anthropogenic, natural, but for the most part, a lot of them happen in the small ponds. Fish cannot escape a small pond when yep. it's really hot, the water's low, and there's no DO. So mm-hmm. that's kind of what that data tells yeah, us. Because even in a reservoir, it could be localized because the reservoirs are so large that uh, fish can swim, right? Mm-hmm. And they would yeah. just leave. So it, it's a little bit more localized even in that big body of water unless the contamination to contaminate a whole reservoir mm-hmm. would have to be just absolutely substantial. Yeah. Small farm pond, a little bit goes a long way because yeah. it's controlled and contained. And as far as it- trend goes this is about oh. all i have and it it kind of looks like it's decreasing but we do have some interesting spikes is that, over, in here. is that over a year the number of events and the number of fish killed average number of fish killed per events mm-hmm. that year <laughs> so um but what i did see is like a lot of times with the you know, the anthropogenic or, you know, something that's caused by some kind of toxic release, mm-hmm. the numbers are a lot larger. Oh, but there's, so it's more extreme. It's more extreme yeah. typically. But very rare. But but very I, rare, more yeah. extreme. So I don't, I don't find that surprising, I don't think. And I thought that our numbers of being reported, will, you know, so, oh, there's, there, you know, like he said, I was like, oh, we're, we're getting better. It's there's less. And he's like, well, I'm sure that maybe people just didn't report. <laughs> so, you know, yeah, you don't know. Yeah. All right. That's all I have for that. So awesome. Sorry, I mean, so the listeners can't see these ugly charts and data. Uh, um, but we can, sheets. we can dream about them in our visions because um, who doesn't love to dream about data, right? We all do. So, <laughs> All right. Well, thanks guys so much. I know earlier you mentioned some websites that folks could go to. Um, and so we don't, you don't need to repeat those. We okay. can, we'll plug them in. Um, and we put some notes up with the show so I can okay. link those at the end. Well, and so if that's, few more Oh yeah. Might want it, so. Okay, cool. And so uh, if you have questions about fish kills or you want to look up some of this information, you can go to the show notes and we will have some websites there for the listeners to click on if they want to read a little bit more about what Clint and Jason came to talk to us about today. And so uh, thanks guys for joining me and telling us about what you do and all about the fish kill stuff. And um, I know you guys do so many other things. So I'm sure that maybe I could harass you to come back on the fish nerd sometime next year. We're from the government. We're here to help. Or eat. <laughs> or eat. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh. Awesome, John. Wow, that was cool. Hey, aren't those guys just too much? I mean, they're funny. They're uh, insightful. They're obviously brilliant. I mean, and anyway, they're, they're, those three together are just... 
just make me smile and, and I got some good laughs out of it and learned a lot and it's exactly what we try to do around here, man. That's perfect. And lots of links in the show notes from that interview too. So any link you might need will be in the show notes. Please check that out and uh, reach out to them if you have any questions. Indeed, please do because they, they want to hear from you. They really, really do. All right, I got one more little thing, just a little there's, dessert. There's always little... one more thing with you, John. Well, you know, I want a little cherry, a little whipped cream, a little something to to finish this up. And I got a story that got cut from the Christmas show because it was already too long. And it's from my friend Rex, who is Rosie's little five-year-old brother. Oh. And he's going to tell us a story about Bunker, which I believe is Menhaden. I believe you're right. Wow. I'm learning. I'm learning. All right. Rex's Bunker and Bluefish story. Here we go. Okay, now. We cannot let Rosie steal the entire show. We have got Rex in the room, and he's got a story for his little brother. Let's have that story. Woo woo! Tell me the fishing story. One time, when me and Dad were out fishing at night at with Paul Toy, bang! I caught a twenty-seven and three-quarter inch striper. What'd you catch him on? Man, I, I caught it on an SP minnow. Another one that the uh, fish wrap writer constantly recommends. And now, we caught three stripers and one bluefish that spit it out peanut bunker everywhere. Uh, oh, man. Splat, splat, splat. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They, they can't quit moving out here. I tell you. I tell you. Hey, Rex, did Daddy have to hang on to the back of your shirt so that striper didn't pull you off into the Atlantic Ocean? Yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, that's, 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 that's what dads are for. Hang on, hang on to that waistline of your jeans and make sure you, uh, you don't end up over in France somewhere. All righty, well, folks. That was cute. <laughs> it is cute. It's cute. A, a, a bluefish puking up bunker is just that's something I can get into because I'm a fisher. Right, me too. I, bluefish puking are the cutest things. Like if you think <laughs> endangered porpoises are cute, you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> that's my motto all right john let's wrap this show up we got some big thanks to do here today who are we thanking doc martin we're th- thanking keep going help me out uh clint and jason and also want to thank wally pleasant for the theme music diana's bath salts for our new theme music i want to thank audio nautics for their song heavy action which i added a little to just for fun well i didn't do it winston mm-hmm. pearlfish did it <laughs> our in-house thrash rocking brit well, make sure and, you thank Winston Pearl House, too. <laughs> yes, Winston Pearlfish. Pearlfish. Sure. I can't remember names for one second. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, we got to thank our families for putting up with this crazy stuff. And I just want to thank all these people that are out looking after our fine world and, and removing dams and, and making sure that we're not wiping out a species over snake oil and out freezing their feet because they just had to try ice fishing and all the rest. Um, and then conceptual artists, I don't always agree, but gosh darn it, you, you've got to be part of the system because you are part of the system and you help it work in your own way. Um, but lastly, I want to thank the listeners for bringing your ears right on in here and letting us fill them up with fish stuff. Hit that like, hit that follow, and leave us a wonderful review if you would, please. Uh, other than that, I think it's time for the Code of the Fish Nerds. All right, let's do this. So until next time, John, follow the Code of the Fish Nerds. Spawn early and often. Never take a free lunch with strings attached. And swim against the current every chance you get. You did it, John. You've made another podcast. Woohoo! Yeah! <laughs> Whether you're fly fishing in a stream, getting those ankles wet, or deep in the ocean casting nets, fish nerds. Fish nerds. Fish nerds. It's a podcast. Just for the halibut! Fry it in a basket or broiled in a pan. Eat it raw like you're in Siam. Fish nerds. Fish nerds. Fish nerds. It's a podcast.